The sun has been worshipped in India from time immemorial. Everyone knows about the Gayatri Mantra. But not everyone knows that the Gayatri Mantra worships the Savitra aspect of the sun. In this glorious tradition of Saura, one of the most important shrines is the Martan Temple. But who built it? Welcome to Itihasa series, taking you to your roots. Every generation is a bridge. It needs to pass on collected wisdom from the past to younger generations. Let's get informed and inspired by Itihasa. Let us know about an emperor whose brilliance was like the sun itself. Today, let us blow away the clouds of ignorance and let the sun called Lalita Aditya Mukta Pida shine. Born in the Karkota dynasty as the son of Durlabhaka Pratap Aditya, he was the youngest among three brothers. Eldest brother Chandrapida ruled for eight years and was killed by the younger brother Tarapida. Tarapida ruled for a short span of time and died. It was then that Lalita Aditya came to power in 724 CE. He ruled for 37 years. Saura, as I said earlier, is a tradition that worships various aspects of the sun. Lalita Aditya's life too had many solar aspects to it. Let us look at the aspects of conquests and friendship. The sun conquers all the land it sets eyes upon. Lalita Aditya too won every war he undertook. Soon after he became king, Junaid al Mari, the governor of the Arab Caliphate, sent the caliph's decree to embrace Islam. Lalita Aditya was not the one to twiddle his thumbs. He made an offensive move and attacked Junaid al Mari. He crossed the Punjab border and defeated the strong army with deft maneuvers of his cavalry. The rulers of Sindh, Multan and Balochistan were vassals of the Arab Caliphate. They had been allowed to rule their land on the condition of accepting Islam. Lalita Aditya instigated these rulers to revolt and stop paying tribute to the Arabs. It led to an economic crisis for the Arabs. After strangling them economically, Lalita Aditya went for the kill. He joined hands with Yashovarman of Kanauj and launched simultaneous attacks by opening two fronts in the northwestern parts of India. It checked Arab expansionism and ended the nuisance. Lalita Aditya ousted the Arabs from Tokharistan. Not only did he succeed in freeing trade routes, but he even helped establish the local Turkish rule there. The Turkish ruler obviously accepted Lalita Aditya's supremacy. While returning from Tokharistan, he attacked Gilgit Baltistan, Dras, Ladakh, and Skardu regions, who were the vassals of Tibet. He freed the Zojila Pass from Tibet. By 730 AD, Lalita Aditya conquered Dardistan or Daradesha, which includes northern Pakistan and Kashmir in India and parts of northeastern Afghanistan. He also conquered Turkestan and Transoxiana. These are portions of Central Asia corresponding approximately with modern Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, southern Kyrgyzstan and southwest Kazakhstan. He attacked Tibet via Gilgit while Yasho Varman attacked from the south, defeating Tibet simultaneously and freeing many trade routes. Lalita Aditya freed the northern trade routes from the Tibetan control. Yasho Varman freed the routes to Tibet from Nepal to Bengal. These campaigns, along with his forays into Zabulistan and Kabul, brought enormous wealth to Kashmir. In 733, Lalita Aditya waged a war against Yasho Varman a war over the distribution of regions vacated by the Arabs as a result of the joint campaign against them. Despite having a huge and strong army, Yashovarman lost to Lalita Aditya. 
to avoid complete annihilation he entered into a treaty Mitra Sharma Lalita Aditya's minister did not like the name of Yashov Varman mentioned in the draft before that of Lalita Aditya he brought it to the notice of Lalita Aditya who liked such attention to detail hence Lalita Aditya decided to go to war again the war ended with a complete rout of Yashov Varman who had to pay for putting his name first later he went on a winning march till kalinga some sources say his successful conquests ranged from the caspian sea to the bay of bengal often we are fed a defeatist narrative that indians never went out to conquer other lands some of us in a twisted way have further tried to showcase this as something to be proud of but this is not true at all we are a nation that worships strength expansion is strength stagnation is weakness the story of lalita aditya's conquests teaches us this but how could he manage such conquests that question can be answered by the second solar aspect of lalita aditya brightness the brightness of a king can be gauged by how he manages his army lalita aditya's army consisted of people from the warrior mountain tribes as well as those experienced in the flat land wars in punjab he could achieve his victories because of this mix lalita aditya recruited chinese military men and utilized their political and martial techniques these were far superior to his contemporaries lalita aditya was able to defeat the arabs because his army was mostly made up by cavalry and foot soldiers in comparison other indian kings relied more on elephants in the plains the arabs used camels and horses elephants restricted the speed of the indian kings which benefited the fast moving arabs lalita aditya with his cavalry could make swift moves great conqueror bright strategist and all is fine but how was his rule for the people this brings us to the third solar aspect warmth have you ever felt the warm embrace of the sun on a cold winter morning that's how lalita aditya's rule was for his people one of the greatest welfare measures he adopted was to rid the kashmir valley of constant flooding this had prevented huge tracts of land from being cultivated he was the first king to realize that by cleaning the bed of rocks and silt the flow of water could be hastened and as a consequence the water level would fall this would make large submerged tracts of land available for cultivation he got numerous canals constructed to ensure that the water starved areas too were brought under cultivation kalhana mentions that he got water wheels constructed for taking water to chakradhara and many other places crop production shot up adding greatly to the prosperity and well-being of the people there was one more solar aspect that characterized lalita aditya's rule discernment or viveka the same sun that burns a dry leaf also ripens the fruit likewise lalita aditya had the intelligence to discern and govern he was fully aware of the problems that could arise if the powerful classes of landed oligarchy called damaras rebelled if they should keep more wealth they would become in a single year very formidable and strong enough to neglect the commands of the king he said he instructed his ministers to be very careful in recruiting people for two wings of the army namely the cavalry and the infantry orders were sent out that no two persons from the same place were to be put in the same company these helped him consolidate his rule and quash any possibilities of internal rebellion one of the most important solar aspects is administration of the solar system the sun holds the planets in the solar system with its mass similarly Lalita Aditya devised an administrative machinery that would keep control over the vassal kings. He did it by creating five new functionaries for the smooth running of administration. Mahapratihara Pida, the High Chamberlain, Mahasandhi Vigrahika, the Chief Minister, 
Mahashvashala, the Minister of Horses, Mahabhandagra, the Keeper of the Treasury, Mahasadhana Bhaga, the Chief Executive Officer. These five officers or Karmasthanas were collectively called as Panchamahashabda. These functions also brought in administrative panache to his kingdoms and that of his vassals. The sun rules creation, doesn't it? Lalita Aditya imbibed this aspect from the sun too. The creative works that were done during his reign are unmatched in the history of Kashmir. He built a city called Parihasapura, the city of joy, after the victories over the Arabs and the Tibetans. He built the Martan temple in Parihasapura, his new capital. Lalita Aditya had constructed a palace for himself a few temples and a chaitya in Parihasapura. Among them, the major temples were Parihasa Keshava, Mukta Keshava, Govardhana Deva and Mahavaraha temples. Lalita Aditya did great public works, buildings and was a patron of learning. Here are some wonders that were created during his rule. An idol of Parihasa Keshava made of 3600 kgs of silver an idol of Mukta Keshava made of 979 kgs of gold, an idol of Narahari which was suspended in the air by fixing magnets above and below it, a Vishnu pillar which measured 54 hands in height and had an image of Garuda at the top, a large statue of Buddha made of 62,000 kgs of copper. The end of any star is a mystery. Likewise, the end of Lalita Aditya is mysterious with many versions. Some say that he abandoned power and embarked on a journey as an ascetic. A few others say that he died during an unexpected snowfall during a military expedition. Some others say he committed suicide to avoid the humiliation of an impending defeat. However, what matters is not how he died, but how he lived and what he achieved. He is surely among the greatest emperors in all of India and without a doubt the greatest that Kashmir produced. He has created a permanent place for himself in history. Look at the pictures of these ruins, of what was once a glorious temple worshipping the sun. It is a metaphor, a metaphor that tells us what has changed in Kashmir between Lalita Aditya's time and now. Are we worthy successors to such great emperors? It is a question to ask ourselves.